right, uh, let's talk about GitHub Actions. But first, let's talk about me, uh, your speaker today. Uh, my name is Sergey. I'm from Minsk, Belarus. Uh, when I was writing this talk, uh, temperature here was like minus 15 Celsius and it was snowing. Uh, I'm sure you guys know what snow is, but just to make sure. And uh, as long as we will be talking about GitHub Actions, I think that the best way to contact me later is my GitHub handle. Uh, it's here on the screen. It will be in this uh, presentation that will be shared with you. Uh, I'll be sharing a small demo with you. And if you have any questions, just uh, feel free to open issues and comment uh, directly on GitHub because you know it's a GitHub Actions talk. Uh, the plan for tonight will be this. Uh, we'll overview GitHub Actions, we'll tell what they are, uh, what issues do they solve, we'll discuss their features. Uh, we'll see uh, an example of a uh, few GitHub workflows, uh, how they provide code quality for your repository, how they provide status checks, uh, how you can make deployments with GitHub Actions and so on uh, in action. Then we'll look at uh, the definitions for those workflows, uh, I mean the code behind the actions. Then we'll see a few examples of uh, crazy GitHub actions uh, at GitHub. I'll just provide you a link uh, that you can study yourself later. Uh, this really crazy ideas implemented with GitHub actions. And finally, there will be a small recap about what we learned today about GitHub actions. Uh, but before, uh, ah, before talking about GitHub actions, I want to, um, to say you what this talk is not about. First of all, it's not a talk about uh, building your own uh, fully featured pipeline with GitHub Actions. Every project is different and your project uh, probably differs from mine. Um, so don't take it too seriously. Uh, you, you're free to make your own pipelines with GitHub Actions with the knowledge you like, gain through this talk. Uh, we won't be discussing a lot writing your own reusable actions and publishing them to GitHub Marketplace, although we will touch this topic slightly, but uh, this is mostly about using actions and writing actions, but not publishing them. Uh, it's not a uh, comprehensive actions guide. Uh, I tried to keep this talk short, but uh, it still will take us uh, probably 14 or even more minutes, and we we'll still miss a few GitHub actions features. Uh, but they are not very essential. Uh, it's not actions sell out. I'm not trying to sell them to you. I'm just trying to convey you uh, information about such tool uh, that you can try for free in your projects. And I think it's really great. Uh, why not trying it? Finally, I'm into GitHub employee and they didn't pay me for this talk, but probably they should. <laughs> Um, before talking about GitHub actions, uh, let's uh, remind ourselves what is CI CD because one of the things about GitHub Actions, when you ask your colleagues, like, hey, have you heard about GitHub Actions? They probably gonna, will answer something like, yeah, that is CI tool from GitHub. Uh, let's talk about CI and CD, continuous integration and delivery. Uh, these are two techniques widely used by programmers today. Um, basically, they mean that you integrate your features in your main, base, uh, main code base uh, frequently, so you don't have long farming features and you release your code frequently as well. Uh, natural to do that frequently, I mean integrating your code and releasing it, uh, naturally you need an extensive testing because if you don't have tests you just integrate some crap into your code base and your code base is broken and you can deploy it, you can deploy a broken code base. Uh, so basically it means testing in its core and this is good because it provides uh, higher quality to your software. If you have a lot of tests, uh, you have less bugs. Although tests don't guarantee 100% bug-free software, having tests is better than don't having them. Um, because you have, because you increase the quality by following these practices, you've uh, decreased uh, the risks of every release. Uh, think about it like uh, riding a bicycle. If you ride it two times, uh, two times per year, you're probably afraid of riding a bicycle because you know it's kind of tricky for you. If you ride bicycle every day, then it becomes your habit uh, and you're really comfortable with it. The same applies to continuous delivery. If you release and deploy your code every day, it becomes your second nature and you're not more afraid of deploying code frequently. So uh, the risk decreases. Um, as a result, you get lower costs because 
you have tests, so you probably have uh, to pay less for, for the testing. You probably can, uh, you know, drop many OKA, leave only automation. Um, you have less bugs in your code, so you have less time to troubleshoot them. Your deployments went, went smooth, so your people don't uh, don't work overnight. You don't have to pay for overtimes for them. Uh, this all decreases the costs. Uh, and it also increases your time to market because you can release more often. You, you release features every day, uh, and they appear in market frequently. Uh, and all these features, uh, at all, they bring you uh, happiness to your teams because you know they work less. Uh, they see their features uh, impact on users. Probably you can increase their salaries because you have some free money, uh, and yeah, it makes people happier. That's why CI and CD uh, are very popular today, and there are a lot of solutions uh, on the market. GitHub Actions is one of them. Uh, other notable mentions are. I will be comparing to them frequently today, where uh, Jenkins pipelines, where uh, GitLab, uh, CI CD, Circle CI, Travis, all those tools were available before GitHub Actions uh, were invented. And GitHub Actions really, uh, uh, it really gathered their um, experience and make their own unique tool, which is unique in, in many ways, as we'll see later. Uh, but describing GitHub Actions just as a, another CI tool will probably be wrong. I would say that uh, GitHub Actions is more than just a CI tool. It's an all-in-one automation solution. Besides solving uh, like pretty common tasks like building, testing, deploying, and packaging your code, uh, it allows you to do some interesting stuff with your projects, which usually requires your third-party tools. Um, these tasks can it put, for example, code reviews? Um, imagine when you have uh, like an old style CI setup, you have a standalone server, probably Garrett or Crucible, and you have your um, uh, version control server and you need to configure them together and you have Jenkins somewhere when tests, uh, for example, um, tests complete, they need to update status in, in Sora or in Crucible uh, and, you know, you have three or four tools and you need to somehow um, connect them. Um, because GitHub Actions runs pre uh, natively in GitHub where your code is stored, it can update statuses uh, just inside GitHub code base. Uh, they really simplify code review because it's only a single tool. You open it and everything there. Um, you can use GitHub Actions for issue triaging. Uh, triaging is um, a technique where, for example, a new issue comes to your repository, you can automatically uh, tag it with some labels or you can assign somebody to this issue. Usually, uh, we're using Jira for issues and again, it's a third party tool and there are dozens of plugins for Jira that could probably solve similar problems, but it's a third party tool and you need to connect it to your code base, you need to connect it to your CI server, and here it's all in one. Project management, again, uh, GitHub has a feature of GitHub projects. It's basically a Kanban board with columns and issues and statuses. It's, um, it's really easier than Jira, more lightweight, but still there is such a feature and GitHub actions can work with GitHub projects. Uh, you can you know, update card states based on uh, some events in your repository. Finally, GitHub Actions allows you to automate, for example, documentation because GitHub has uh, wikis. Wikis is basically a markdown Wikipedia, like um, like you have, uh, how, how is it called, the tool? Uh, Confluence, yeah. Uh, basically, GitHub Wiki is the same as Confluence, but more lightweight. And you can use actions to update your documentation in GitHub Wiki. That's cool because it's, again, it's the same tool. Uh, finally, GitHub Actions are really a code, a code running in, uh, in response to some actions. And as long as this is a code, you can do pretty much everything with, get, with, this, with GitHub Actions. One notable uh, example of that is a chess game implemented in GitHub Actions, which we'll see today in, uh, after, after the demo. Um, basically, yeah, it's a chess board. Um, 
and you can move figures and actions take part of uh, validating the moves of uh, checking the rules of you know knowing if there is a winner or loser in this game and it's all automated by github actions it's pro probably not the features that you want to see in your project because it's kind of kind of a joke uh, but still it shows us the power of, Git of github actions uh, really there are no limits in how you can apply it to your project so uh, another important idea uh, which i want to state separately is that github actions are not about automating something in your code only i mean build test deploy package it's about automating your whole repository uh, you can automate every aspect of a repository that you may think of. As I've mentioned previously, it's, it may be issues, documentation, projects, uh, environments, deployments, releases, everything that uh, is um, supported by GitHub is automatable uh, using GitHub Actions. Uh, let's uh, see what features does GitHub Actions provide to you. And let's start from the hardware, because you know Actions are code, as I mentioned, and they need to run somewhere. You have uh, like three options out of the box, Linux, MacOS, and Windows. Um, this is basically named runners in GitHub and GitHub provides you with those three. Um, and they may cover practically all your needs, uh, like building desktop apps, uh, backend services, and mobile apps, as you see. But if you have some real uh, strange requirements for building your code, you can bootstrap your own uh, server to be used as a GitHub runner, or GitHub Actions runner. So you are not limited uh, only to those three. You can use anything you want. Uh, GitHub Actions are really polyglot. They support uh, code in any language, as long as you can run this language in Docker, or you can run this language on your own self-hosted runner. So your, your runner supports it. You can run it in GitHub Actions. But for some languages, it provides some extra support. And you can see the list uh, on the screen like Node.js, Python, Java, Haskell, Ruby, all these languages um, provide some uh, pre-existing actions in, a, uh, in Marketplace, which we'll be talking a little bit about later. And so if your project uses one of those, uh, you can get some benefits uh, from you reusing the code from the Marketplace. And of course, uh, it means that if your project is written in TypeScript, this means that you're okay too, because TypeScript is covered by Node.js. The same applies to, for example, Kotlin or Groovy, because they're covered with Java. Uh, another cool feature for language supporting GitHub Actions is that if you have an existing project, uh, existing repository in GitHub, and it uses one of those languages, um, and you don't have any workflows and actions uh, set up in your repo, you can, um, uh, there is a feature to auto-generate a default workflow based on your code base. And if your project follows like um, standard practices for your framework for a language, like for example, it uses Maven and it has pom.xml in the root of your project. Uh, so yeah, creating pro a GitHub action workflow for this project is as simple as clicking one button. You just click like create a default, act, uh, default workflow and it will probably create a workflow that runs M MVN clean install action. It's very simple. Um, like what other features are available there? Um, you can see it on the screen, but first one that I want to mention is that GitHub actions, they uh, run in the context of GitHub. It's not a third party tool, third party server. It's uh, still GitHub. So everything that is available uh, in GitHub may be releases, deployments, environments, uh, status checks and so on. Um, all those are available in Actions by using uh, GitHub API. So you can use it directly uh, if, if you want. But for some of those features like artifacts or environments, there are uh, higher level uh, primitives in Actions, which we'll be see how, how can you use it in your Actions. For example, for artifacts, if your build um, generates a zip file, or a jar file that you want to publish, uh, you can use artifacts to do that. And you can put that artifact into a GitHub releases section. So when uh, users come to your repository and they open like latest releases and they, they may see this artifact, they may even download it and check it. 
The same applies to environment and you'll see how it can be useful uh, where you come to the repository and see, you can see where it is deployed and it's natively supported by GitHub. Uh, secrets caches, uh, it's probably features you can find in every CI tool. It's basically about storing some private information to be used in builds and caching build results to speed up further builds. Uh, services, uh, if you were working with, for example, GitLab CI or Bitbucket pipelines, you may know that for some kind of tasks, you need a separate container to be running parallel with your build. Like if you're testing database, you probably need a fresh database for your DB tests. And with GitHub Actions, it is uh, available as a service container, which runs in parallel. And as long as you can put your like requirements in Docker, you can use services and you're covered. Metric builds is also a feature found in some CI solutions. Uh, it allows you to build um, like a matrix of projects based on the values of some variables. Like if you need an Android app for release and debug flavors for old and new devices, you can define those variables like release debug, old and new, and you get four builds uh, using only single workhole definition by metric builds. So yeah, it basically builds your projects for all the permutations of the variables. Uh, of course, GitHub Actions allows you to stay tuned about your project status. Uh, it has notifications uh, when something happens with, uh, with any of your workflows, you'll be notified by email and you'll be notified by the GitHub itself. You'll see uh, a message in your inbox. Uh, it integrates natively with uh, GitHub status checks. Um, there are status checks for pull requests and for commits. And whenever something fails uh, in those pipelines, and you'll see a like, error sign. And you can generate uh, badges to be used in dashboards. Badges is just basically an image showing that uh, some specific pipeline, some specific workflow pass it or fail it. And you can use a link to this image to be used in dashboards. And when you open this dashboard, you can quickly see whether, for example, the last deployment was successful or not. And the killer feature of GitHub Actions is actually a marketplace. Uh, if you're used to tools like Jenkins, you probably know that the was uh, Jenkins uh, how, Jenkins plugin repository. It was like a, a site looking like from the previous millennia uh, where basically plugins were stored as uh, zip artifacts and you had to download them and install manually by you know dragging into the class path of your Jenkins server and there was literally no guarantees that it will work, that it won't break your installation. And, you know, if you are not an admin of Jenkins, you probably won't even do that. You, you should ask admin. It was really like, cumbersome to make that. It was like, you know, using mobile phones because uh, before Apple invented iTunes and Marketplace is like App Store for actions. Uh, you just go to the good looking site. You look for the action you want, like Maven. And there are plenty of uh, available actions for running Maven tasks. You choose the one you need. It provides you with um, like instructions how to use it in your workflows. It's very simple and we'll see a lot of examples today in our demo, like probably 80% of workflows consist of reusable code from the marketplace. Uh, it really reduces uh, the time you need to develop your workflows. If it all sounds interesting to you, here is the offer. Like uh, actions are free for public repositories and for your own self-hosted runners. If you have a public repository, you can just go and enable actions for it if it's not already enabled. If you have a private repository but you still want to use free offering, you can bootstrap your own server if you also, of course, have it and use it uh, to run your tasks. It will be free for you as well. And finally, if you don't have like open all public repositories, and if you don't have any free servers to be used as runners, uh, there are options for you as well. And um, you have right now you have two uh, two thousand minutes per user per month for free to run your actions. But um, yeah, you can just pay some money, not very big money, and enjoy the actions. Um, that was kind of a feature overview. Let's look. Uh, let's try to build a mental model of how actions work and basically what they are. 
Um, remember, I told you that actions automate not your code base, but the whole repository. And the first thing to, you should understand about the actions uh, are events. Events are basically events that happen uh, in your repository. For example, when you push code in your repository, a push event appears. When you open a pull request to your repository, a pull request event appears. When you make uh, a release in GitHub, there is a button like make release, uh, a release event appears. Uh, when somebody deploys something, a deployment appears. When somebody forks your repository, a fork appears. And yeah, you can run actions when somebody forks your repository. Uh, when somebody comments on an issue, there is an event for that. And when you move project cards in GitHub projects, there are events for that. There are probably like two or three dozen of different events in GitHub, and you can find the list uh, in the documentation. But basically, every action that um, that appears in your GitHub repository it generates an event, and events triggers workflows. Workflows is the second entity in GitHub Actions. Um, basically, they are YAML files who reside in a special uh, directory in your repository. Uh, the directory is uh, .github slash workflows. Uh, you put multiple YAML files, um, specially edited files there, and they are your workflows. Whenever an event happens, uh, workflows that are listening for those events are triggered and they are run uh, in parallel. Uh, so one important thing here is that workflows run in parallel whenever the event they are triggered uh, occurs. Uh, now diving deeper into a workflow, a single workflow consists of uh, a set of jobs. Uh, so if we like, look at the default YAML file from previous slide, uh, it may consist of uh, jobs like lint, build, test, and QA deployment. So basically it's static analysis. Uh, it's uh, like creating a jar file, testing it, and deploying to some QA environment for, for testing. Uh, jobs run in parallel as well by default, but uh, you can make them run uh, consequently because jobs can depend on each other. For example, to Q, uh, lint and build could probably run at the same time. Uh, or lint and test could probably run at the same time. But to deploy something, you need first to build it. So in this example, you can say that QA deployment depends on build. And builds probably should depend on lint and test. Um, and they form a tree, like a direct acyclic graph of tasks. And we'll see that in demo as well. Um, a job can wait for its deployments to finish, and then it starts. Finally, at the lowest level, there are steps. Each job consists of uh, multiple steps. For example, uh, the build job from previous slide may consist of such steps as checking the code, uh, the specific revision that was triggered by event, uh, then configuring your like programming environment, let it be Java in this case. Uh, then you compile and test your code, and then you just package it into a jar file. Probably you could add some releases here and, and so on, but. Uh, basically, these steps are the, the most granular, the smallest parts of uh, GitHub Actions. Actually, steps uh, are uh, steps come in two kinds. Um, one kind of steps are actions, and here it should be uh, written from the lower letter A. When I say GitHub Actions and uh, A is uh, uppercase, it's a trademark by GitHub, GitHub Actions. And when it's a lower letter A, it's, uh, it's basically a reusable action from, uh, from GitHub Marketplace. So if we take that build uh, job from previous, um, uh, from previous slide, it may consist of these steps. And from those steps, two of them you can find in, uh, in the Marketplace. You don't need to write any code to check out uh, your, your code because you can reuse the action. Actions check out, does that thing. The same applies to Java. Uh, because Java is one of the supported languages by GitHub Actions, there is a, an action that basically sets it up and makes it available to you. And yeah, there are actions for Node.js, for, for all those languages from the previous slide. Um, and the second uh, flavor of uh, steps that we see here are basically, basically run steps. If, there are no ready actions in marketplace for, for example, 
to run Gradle, you can just uh, use run command and run everything you need. You can put um, all these actions in a shell file and run that shell script here, or you can like execute them one by one in run uh, statements. It really doesn't matter. And this is basically the mental model of uh, how GitHub Actions work. This is the most uh, complex slide in this talk, but let's let's recap one more time uh, how GitHub Actions work. Um, the model is that uh, in a workforce directory, you contain, you put there YAML files that define your workflows. You can have as many workflows in your repository as you want. So here are these big uh, boxes are workflows. Okay. Uh, this, yeah. This is pointer, the laser pointer. These are workflows. Workflows are triggered by events. And here events are these um, like talkless boxes. Here we see the default workflow is triggered by push and pull request events. Uh, release workflow is triggered only by pushes to master branch. You can kind of uh, specify for the granular events here. And deploy workflow is triggered by a release event that happens in your repository. Uh, now here we see jobs. Uh, examples are lint job, build and test, package, release, and deploy. And each job consists of steps. And steps uh, comes in two flavors, uh, actions from GitHub marketplace and steps you write yourself, which can execute some commands from your repository like Gradle wrapper or execute external software. For example, if you have Ansible in your runner, you can execute it uh, in a run action. And that's basically it. Uh, one job can depend on other job. Here it is exposed by this green um, green arrow. So a package job, it waits for build, test, and plint. Uh, workflows run in parallel, but there is one trick uh, to make them run consequently because a workflow ca can generate an event that triggers another workflow. And here we see the example with release and deploy. Our release workflow uh, creates new release. And it uses a, a GitHub action for that, actually, because yeah, there is an action to create a release. You don't need to create release using GitHub API. Uh, and this created release, it triggers another event to appear in your repository, release, release it. And you can have another workflow uh, that just listens for these events. And it will start and, for example, deploy that new release into production. This way, you can like trigger workflows one by one. Uh, the problem here is that you can't trigger arbitrary events. Uh, so you can't trigger event name at my event one. Uh, it's only a predefined set, like two or three dozen of events that you can probably trigger. And not of them are triggerable by, by actions. Some of them um, you, you can ge cannot generate that event, but still you can have this kind of a pipeline and yeah, this mental model is actually everything you need to know about GitHub Actions because all other things are like implementation details. Uh, YAML syntax, uh, expressions, and, and all that kind of stuff, is, it's, really, it's really easy. You just open the documentation and read whenever you need. But here is the model, how it works. And let's see them in actions. Uh, let's see them in actions. I've prepared a repository for you. I'll send you a link. Um, well, how do I open the Zoom when I'm presenting? I think you have to hover the mouse on Zoom window. Yeah, thank you, I see. So I've sent you a link. Uh, this is a demo repository for today. Uh, if you're bored listening about actions, what I'm uh, proposing you to do is open this repository and just uh, change something in it using GitHub Web Editor. You can do that without forking or cloning this repo. And, and you can see how actions are triggered for your particular change and you can see the feedback uh, for your changes. Uh, I'll do the same thing, but uh, first let's, uh, let's see what app do we have in this. Uh, in this code base. Basically, this app is uh, a web endpoint that returns the programming quotes. I've deployed it to Amazon, 
basically when I refresh this page, there are like five, probably 10 quotes in the database and they are returned in a random order. It's a very, very simple app. So it returns on the string and it's a random string. Um, yeah, and imagine that a new feature request came to us uh, saying that this uh, quote, it should be prepended with, um, with something like quote of the day, because right now it's not quite clear what, what this quote is about. We need to state it, like this is quote of the day. And I will be pretending that I am very, very new to Java, to Kotlin, to you know programming, and I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah, I'm given this task and I'm given this repository and manager asks me like, uh, you know, we need this quote of the day be prepended to that string. And here I be like, oh, okay, what's here? I'm looking to this repository, finding some random class and looking like this. Okay, yeah, it says something about quotes. Probably this is the class that I need to change. Yeah, why not? Um, I can do that, by the way, just in the GitHub without cloning, without opening any editors. Let's let's say that, yeah, quote of the day, why not? Let's put it right here randomly. Um, now I have an option to create pull request with these changes. Uh, and I'll do that. Let's name this branch like, yeah, then. And I propose a change. When I push this button, a new pull request is created. Uh, and and what happens next? Um, you see that in this pull request, which is uh, which was opened automatically by my change, we have a set of status checks that uh, didn't yet complete it, and I cannot merge my uh, pull request. I'm the owner of the reports, and I I should have merge permissions, but I can't uh, before all these checks pass it. And I see that there are pre-configured checks for tests and DB tests. And uh, because this workflow, which we'll see in a second, is configured for both push and pull request events, uh, we have it configured twice. But they're a little bit different. One of them is configured for the commit that was yeah, made by me. And another one is uh, triggered for, uh, for the pre-merged state. I'm making um, a pull request to the master branch from demo branch. Uh, when I merge them, there will be like another state in the repository. And this uh, pull request uh, workflow is triggered for that state. Uh, for example, it can be like when I merge this branch, something may be uh, wrong in that merge. And I will see that in the pull request uh, details. And yeah, by the way, something failed. I looks like I can't uh, merge this change. And here I can just uh, click on the details link, which is integrated into the GitHub, as I told you. And here is the actions UI. Actually, I see that DB test action failed. Uh, and I can read the logs. Uh, I, I know what the problem is, but I see that our DMDB quotes test failed because, yeah, I changed something in, uh, in my entity. Uh, it, it can't find entity anymore because I changed the key. Uh, at the same time, the tests uh, pass it because my tests, um, wh when I prepared this repository, I actually know that the first talk was about uh, GUnit 5. So uh, this repository also contains tests in GUnit 5. And you can look at how I split it, uh, unit tests and DB tests into separate um, like suits. Uh, so they can run, uh, they can be run in parallel. So because I changed it to the part uh, that was about the database, our usual tests, they, like, they are okay, nothing wrong with them, but the DB tests failed. Uh, and finally, we have our results, test results published, and uh, we can probably even see uh, what's wrong with our, with our code, the line that was failed. Of, of course, we have a status check here. We have, uh, we see that the whole rec the pull request fails and we can't merge it. Uh, and where is this? Yeah, if you open the details for this uh, uh, test results, you'll see the particular line uh, that failed. 
So here are the test results. And here are the test lines. We can see that that particular line that I changed it, it failed. And as you see, I don't need to go to some third party tools um, and dig into these details. It's right in my GitHub. I don't even have any editor open. It. It's all web UI. Um, before changing things back and before fixing it, let's look at the um, workflow definition. And as you know, workflows, they stayed in, uh, in a special GitHub workflows directory. And that was a default workflow because we have another one for deployment. We'll see it later. So let's look at our default workflow that was triggered and that was um, that updated their states and disabled our pull request. Here is it. Uh, here's its uh, YAML definition. Uh, we can specify a name for a workflow. This is the way how we configure a workflow to listen for those events that I was talking about. Here, our workflow listens for push events for all the branches except master because for master we'll be using another workflow for deployments and we listen for pull request events. This is how you register your workflows. Now, remember that a workflow consists of a jobs and we have three jobs here. It's test, it's a DB test, and it's a test publish. We publish test results, but by the way, there is a typo here. Uh, let's look at the test job. Uh, a test job, uh, you can specify a runner to be used. I use, um, I don't use any self-hosted runners here. I use publicly available uh, runners by GitHub. And there is one that runs Ubuntu Linux, which is okay for me because I build like Java software and uh, I don't need any Mac uh, or Windows here. And uh, this test job, it consists of such step as checking the code out. Uh, basically, it's a git clone command. So this is an alias for git clone. After I clone it my, um, my code, I need to set up Java. Uh, a specific Java version is required to build this project, it's 11. And that action from marketplace, it just allows me to very, very simply make that. Like, yeah, you see, I don't download uh, any Java from Oracle accepting licenses and so on. It's just three lines of code. And these three lines, you can find them on uh, Marketplace. Just copy paste them in your workflow and you're good to go. Um, there is a cache config here. Uh, I want my builds to be very fast. So whenever I download some binaries, and in this case, uh, it's Gradle, uh, and I can just cache it when my workflow ends. And next time I run this, uh, this build, this workflow, a cached binary could be used. Here we see an example of GitHub uh, expression language. It's kind of a special expression languages available in Actions. Um, there are some variables you can use in them. Of course, you can find um, the link, uh, the, the whole list of these variables uh, in the GitHub documentation. But basically, uh, I use the expression here to cache my bi Gradle binaries based on the env environment I'm running in. Uh, it's currently operating system and the content of my files. So whenever I change one of these files, my cache should be invalidated. And there is a function in those expression language named hash files, which could be used for that. Uh, and there are a lot of functions and a lot of expressions you can use, but again, it's all implementation details. What, you, what I want you to understand is that there is a ready to use action that allows you to cache something in your build. And it's all managed by GitHub. Finally, I can run my test command. Uh, and uh, after the tests, I have some artifacts available. Actually, these artifacts are test results because every test, it generates some you know, XML files that you can, uh, and reports that you can view that basically tells you about the coverage, tells you about what lines fail it, what tests fail it and pass it and so on. And I know that they exist in this directory, build test results and reports, and I just pack them into artifact name and test results and make it available for later use. Uh, the same goes for the DB test. It's basically all the same, except that I run a, another task, not a test, but a DB test. And basically a DB test is configured to run the tests tagged with a DB tag. And there is uh, a notion of tags in uh, JUnit 5. But another interesting feature about DB tests is they actually need a DB to be run against. Uh, and here we see how we can use services to spin up a database during your test run. 
my database is DynamoDB, and uh, I know that there is um, a Docker image with DynamoDB uh, name at local stack, and uh, I can just run it, expose some ports from it, uh, pass some environment variables, um, and whenever this service is started, it will be available. Um, like yeah, it will be available at localhost for my uh, tests. And I declare this variable, which points to this service running DB. And then later in tests, um, I won't show them. It's just like system get env in Java. I just get value of this variable. And uh, yeah, I use it in tests and I can connect to the database uh, and yeah, basically use it. Finally, um, the, and these two jobs, DB test and test, they could be run in parallel because they are independent. But uh, publishing test results, it depends on both of them. And we actually specify this by this needs clause. Uh, it says that wait for test and DB test to finish and then publish their results. Now, the reason interest in seeing these tests is that, um, well, actually GitHub will uh, fail and stop executing your actions uh, when it sees any errors. So whenever any command fails, the action, uh, the, the whole workflow fails. But it's not uh, actually very convenient for tests because you want to see test results even if the tests fail it. So here is why I use this if clause always. It says that even if one of those jobs failed completely, like the test failed, I still want to see my test results. Uh, so this will basically run this job uh, nevertheless, like no matter what the results are. Uh, and again, the steps that it consists are mostly from GitHub Marketplace. I don't need to write anything uh, here. I just download the test results artifact created in my tests. And then I use uh, another open source um, action from Marketplace, like action JUnit report, which basically sends these JUnit reports and makes it available as GitHub status checks. And I just pass the parameters like what files to include in these reports. Um, and this whole workflow was triggered by my change. And um, this workflow, it exposed that broken status here. I see that something is wrong. And this uh, whole workflow now uh, disallows me this pull request. And this all happens really automatically. I don't have to, you know, configure um, anything except the pipeline itself. Pipeline failed. I can't merge this PR, and I see this status. It's failed. Uh, now let's go back to the repository and finally fix it. Um, not to the repository, but uh, let's fix it right here in, in place. Sergey, may I ask you just one question regarding the workflow? I saw some yeah, sure. comments to remove some log files. Why do we need that ah, comments? Yeah, um, just, just a second, I open it. This is a very specific for Gradle uh, because you, you're talking about this, right? Yes, yes. Um, so basically when I put something in my cache, um, I want to put every, everything here in my cache. Sorry, I'll drink some water. But um, um, when I put these files, it's a log file. Um, it shouldn't be cached because it's basically a process ID of my Gradle container. And even though all my dependencies are cached fairly, a process ID will be different next time I run it. So you shouldn't store mm -hmm. process ID in your cache. Uh, and the same applies to this GC properties. So uh, after my whole job runs, I just need to delete manually those two files, not them to appear in cache. Because actually this cache action, it doesn't take place immediately when I put it here. It just configures what files will be cached. But uh, the cache itself, it, um, it runs after the job. I will mm -hmm. uh, show you a little bit later. And before it runs, I just remove two files. It's very specific to Gradle. You, you don't want uh, that for, for example, for Marlin or Node.js. It's just Gradle thing. And uh, yeah, let's look about um, 
how okay good is thank you for the explanation no no it's not a problem i just want you to show how uh, this cache works for example let's take it this test when it uh, click on the job there is another ui that shows me all the steps and uh, you see that we have some steps not declared in the pipeline name it post some of those actions uh, they actually register handlers that run after the job and actually the cache uh, our cache it runs after our job so we mm -hmm. uh, we have some like time to delete something uh, inside our code before the cache actually takes place. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, well, let's fix that code. Um, let's fix it back. And let's uh, let's change another file just to make it um, to make what we want. Just to show you the deployments. The deployments will really take place. Um, while I'm doing something with with the code, you can ask me questions because we have we have almost uh, run out of time, and I still have some stuff. Yep, to guys, about. just unmute yourself and ask any question. We are open. By the way, I'd like to say that your presentation is really awesome. I like how you use emojis for each statement and they are very tightly uh, connected with the words in your presentation. Yes. Okay, so um, let's drop the pull request, the broken one, and let's open another one with the cord fixes just to show you the deployments. So again, I changed the file. Now uh, it should be okay because I'm pretty sure that I didn't broke anything. Uh, and we'll just wait for these uh, checks to pass. This is basically the same default workflow, but in this case, every, everything should be fine. And then when I merge this pull request, uh, it will be deployed to production, and next time I refresh this page, we'll be able to see here like quarter of the day. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, let's take a look at that workflow, just not to waste any time. It's really simpler than the first one. Um, so, uh, the deployment workflow. It is also triggered by a push event, but it is different that it is triggered by pushes only to master branch. So when I push to a feature branches, no deployment happens. When I push to master branch, a deployment happens. Uh, basically, you can, for example, uh, disable uh, direct pushes into master. So um, you can only add code to master by merging any branches or pull requests. Uh, in this way, you can, you know, you can be pretty sure that whenever some code is push it into master, it's already reviewed, tested, and so on. Uh, but again, uh, it's not the guide how to make pipelines. It's just me in this simple repository, I decided to go this way. You could probably make uh, another more comprehensive pipeline. Uh, this workflow, it consists only of one single but pretty big task, name it uh, deploy. Uh, it again runs on Ubuntu because like, Linux is uh, good for that. It features another interesting um, GitHub feature, name it environment. Um, whenever you deploy something, you can declare that you deployed it to some name it environment, and you can register a link to this environment, and it will be available. I'll show it to uh, you later. And this link, it also comes from an expression, and this time it's a different expression. We use an output of one of our steps. So we have steps. We have a step name at URL below the last one. See this one? And it declares, using the same expression syntax, it declares a single output name at URL, which will be effectively that dynamic uh, URL, because you see it's not, it's not exposed by, uh, um, well, it's dynamic lambda URL. 
So here I declare that this production environment will be available by this URL and the URL will be uh, like defined dynamically in our steps. Uh, and the steps are pretty much similar. We check out our code, we set up Java, we set up cache, it's basically copy paste uh, from that. We create an artifact to be deployed. Um, and here is another interesting thing that uh, you can run multiple languages, you can use multiple languages um, inside a single workflow. My my app is a Java app and I need Java to build it. But my deployment script uses TypeScript actually, it's a CDK, it's a tool by AWS and it uses TypeScript. So I need Node.js to run it. And what I do, I just set up Node and voila, I have Node after this. Um, after this step available. Uh, and of course I can cache node files, but this time the cache will be different. It will be based on a package log file, not Gradle wrapper properties, but a package log. Uh, but still it's a different cache and both of them will be available next time I run my build and it will be really uh, faster. Uh, then I run usual NPM commands, like for every NPM project, NPM install. Um, and finally, Another action from uh, from uh, from the marketplace configuring credentials because basically to deploy something to AWS you need um, you need a user with specific permissions uh, and I have in this repository configured two secrets uh, AWS uh, AWS uh, access key and secret key and this action requires actually those values. Um, with this with parameters and I use the same expression syntaxes to um, uh, to refer to those secrets from the repository settings. So they are passed to this action and it like prepares uh, a special file that can be used by CDK later. Finally, I I run my CDK deploy command, which deploys basically my code to production. Um, at this time, at this moment, I think uh, our pull request passed. It. Yeah, as you see, I've refresh its uh, pull requests page and I see that my pull request is totally okay to merge. Uh, all the checks pass it, everything is green and I just uh, push this merge button. Uh, what happens now is that um, a merge commit uh, is created in a master branch and this merge commit, it triggers my uh, deploy workflow. Here you can see this uh, workflow name. And uh, we can see how it goes on. We even can see uh, its, uh, its process, like it's 10% like deployed to production. We can click here, look at the steps it takes. Um, of course, we'll have logs and so on. By the way, for the artifacts, I didn't mention. If you have some um, problems, uh, for example, your tests fail it and you need to debug them, uh, remember those artifacts that we uh, created? Uh, they are available at the GitHub UI below. You have the test results. Uh, it's a zip file. If you click it, you'll just download it locally. Uh, so you can check it later on your computer. It's just a feature. If you need it, you can use it. It's not required. Just you know, an interesting feature of how to use artifacts. And now let's wait for our deployment to end. Um, this progress bar, you probably are interested how it's calculated. Uh, it basically gets the number of steps in this um, in this job. And basically, if, if you executed eight out of 10 steps, it will be like 80%, but it doesn't take any time into account. One of your steps can take all the time, but it will be like the last step. Um, but yeah, still it's it's kind of nice feature to see here. I have a question regarding the runners. Uh, it, it mentioned like Ubuntu 20.04 yes, or yes. something. Is it a Docker image or is it a virtual machine? And from what point it's pulled? I'm asking because uh, Docker Hub introduced new limitations. And if you, for example, want to use some publicly available images you may end up with problem that you just pass the limit for docker pools for that image 
and your CI will be broken. So how they provide these runners for you? Will does GitHub provide some uh, like proxy to download these images and you specify something like internally available from this GitHub or it just pulls every time the image from Docker Hub? Yeah, I understand the question, good one. Uh, no, it doesn't pull it every time. It is cached by GitHub. Uh, and yes, it's a Docker image basically, but it's not uh, it's not the one that is available like Ubuntu latest from Docker Hub. It's a special image. You can find the whole specification in GitHub in GitHub Actions documentation. It's not a black box. Uh, there is a special doc for that. Uh, it lists all the available values for those for like you can choose 20 or you can choose latest or you can choose a previous version. So it's all documented. And if you are particularly interested in what's inside this image, uh, there is a link to GitHub um, page where it lists basically everything that is is that image. It's not uh, it's not an empty or minimal Ubuntu. It contains a lot of stuff pre-installed. It the weight of this image is like 20, 20 gigs. And of course, it is cached by GitHub. It's not downloaded every time. But uh, mm -hmm. if you need to use your own image from Docker Hub, it's just a matter of replacing uh, that Ubuntu 20.04 with your own uh, GitHub handle or Docker handle, and it will mm -hmm. pull from Docker. And yeah, it, it caches images for some little amount of time. So it won't uh, download it for every particular job run, uh, but. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what is the cache in time, probably a few days, like maybe a week. Uh, but everything is documented, very good. Uh, everything. Okay, uh, it's clear now. Thank you. Yeah, finally, we see that our deployment succeeded. Uh, and let's go to our main repository page. Um, here at the right, we see this environments link. We have one configured environment we can see the, its status here, yeah, it's active because we deployed it and we can click on it and uh, it will open the environment. But before we do that, let's check uh, the uh, status basis here. In my repository, I included links to two um, to, uh, status images. One is for deploying master, we see that it passed it. And the other one is for deploy uh, default workflow for master branch. The problem is that we didn't find the default workflow for master branch, it is excluded. That's why we see no status for it. But for deploying, we see that everything is okay. Now let's go and check our uh, our deployment. There is a page which shows uh, the deployment history for our environment, which is also a good stuff because you can see who deployed which revision at which environment. You know, I've seen a lot of projects who maintain a shared document with, uh, with all the environments and you need to update it whenever you like deploy some code. Here, it's all automated. It's our production deployed by me from branch demo one, like six minutes ago. All the information in here. And there is a button, view deployment, which brings us directly into that link from that output steps. And we see that now it responds with this quote of the day prefix. Uh, before our you know quarter of the day. So yeah, basically this is how GitHub Actions work. Um, you you you'll be uh, shared the slides. Uh, feel free to fork this repository, open pull requests, uh, like you know use it, use it to play with it, and so on. Um, now let's go back to our presentation because a few slides are still left for us. Um, so yeah, we, we've gone over this um, syntax be between the deployments, so we are covered here. Now uh, a few words about actions in the wild. Yeah, and I should probably go back from, from widescreen. Uh, the first crazy action that I w want to talk to you about is a chess game. Uh, that famous example. Let's just open it and see what it's about.
Um, so this is a game of chess. This is the board. Um, this board is managed by GitHub Actions. Here is a list of available movements, and this is it now. It's a turn. Uh, it's a black turn. So a solid figure moves. Let's actually play this game. <laughs> Who stops us? Uh, what move can we do? I see a good move. This pawn from um, from a4 could uh, beat this pawn on b3. Right? Agree. Um, here is a list of moves. Uh, yeah, it's a4. From a4 to b3. All I have to do here is to click this link. Uh, this link creates a new issue in this repository. Uh, an issue is sp uh, specially named. Like, see, it's a, a machine readable format, like chess, move from to some meta information, and so on. Whenever I submit this issue, there is a workflow in this uh, repository. Let's look at it, which is configured to run for every issue. Uh, here is it. On issues type open. So whenever I open an issue, this workflow, it's, and it's really, really, really big because it's a game of chess and it's written actually in Ruby. Uh, when I open an issue, it is triggered. It validates my movement and it updates the board. It will take it really some time, like probably 15 minutes because it's, it's kind of slow. But I will really get a notification at my email about the outcome of my move. And whenever this game ends, I, I played chess a few times, so I know what happens. Uh, when the game ends, I will get even an email about who won, who took uh, part in this game, like GitHub handles of users who submitted um, uh, submitted like movements to this game, and so on. So this is really crazy stuff. You shouldn't probably do that in your repo like like that. But it shows you how endless possibilities about GitHub Actions are. You can make pretty much everything with it. Um, another good example of this is a Sokoban game. We won't uh, go through it, but it's basically a game where you push boxes into a dungeon. Uh, yeah, a Sokoban game. Uh, there is a blogging platform made on um, GitHub pages. Uh, and actually, GitHub has a COVID-19 uh, dashboard publicly available made on this uh, blogging platform completely at GitHub Actions. Uh, basically, what it does, it um, makes, it turns your Python notebooks and markdown sources into a fully featured static blog, completely without any software, just using GitHub Actions. Uh, one guy uh, at the internet made um, a very funny <laughs> repository named Stupid Actions, and he has a smart light which can be controlled via REST API, and he uses actions to switch his light whenever he makes pushes into his repository. Um, again, you'll be provided a link, you just feel free to you know check it out. Uh, this action of Wolf, uh, it, uh, for every pull request opened in your repository, it looks um, uh, GIFs with docs on Giphy site and posts it as a comment to this pull request. Just uh, fun, fun stuff. And you can find even more su such crazy actions uh, on a Dev2 site by this uh, hashtag, actions hackathon. Basically, it's a hashtag uh, that are used by people when they create some GitHub actions, they post blog posts about it and tag with this um, hashtag. So you can find more and more crazy actions by this hashtag. Uh, feel free to explore it. Finally, the final part of our talk is recap. What we learned today. We learned about GitHub actions, basically what they are, how can they be used and their place in a CI world. We learned about the components that comprise GitHub Actions, like events, workflows, jobs, steps, and actually uh, some kind of steps like actions. We learned about uh, syntax. It was a really um, like quick uh, going into the demo, but I hope you understand that actions are YAML-based. Uh, you can learn syntax from the documentation. We didn't stop on it uh, in details, but yeah, basically it's YAML. Uh, it has some how do you say that in YAML, like tags, and you put some special values for those tags and basically your workflow runs. Uh, we learned about using variables and secrets. Remember that uh, AWS configuration in my repository. Uh, so you can securely store some private keys and some passwords in your GitHub actions to be used by deployments, for example. 
We learned about using service containers. Remember that the MDB uh, running for my DB tests. We learned about caching, and actually there was even in details about Gradle. Um, we've seen how to use actions from marketplace. All those actions starting from user stack are from marketplace. Uh, and yeah, I didn't show you the marketplace site. You probably just go and open and look at it. Uh, yourself. Uh, we've seen artifacts, how we used artifacts to pass to pass data between the jobs. And I also shown you where you can find artifacts in the GitHub UI. Uh, and finally, we've seen deployments and environments. We've really seen how GitHub deployed our web and we've really seen it went to production. Uh, and yeah. But there are a lot of things that we didn't cover today. It's actually workflow templates. Uh, it's a way to share uh, workflows in your organization. If you have an organization in GitHub with multiple repositories, you can put some uh, templates into your uh, organization and it will be available to all the repositories in that organization. Um, we slightly covered matrix builds. I just told you what it is, but uh, I didn't demo them because of, yeah, it's not needed for a simple Java app. Um, I didn't show you how to work with repository releases, but actually GitHub has a special feature, GitHub releases. Uh, they are listed uh, at the right uh, above the environments, but you can publish releases and people could be notified that there is a recent new release of their favorite library or app. And it is available in Actions as well. Um, we also didn't cover GitHub packages. Basically, it's something like uh, GitHub managed uh, artifactory or Nexus repository. Uh, you can publish Maven artifacts there. You can publish Docker images, uh, Node.js packages right into GitHub. And of course, using GitHub Actions, but we didn't cover it. We didn't learn about configuring self-hosted runners because it's probably not, not very interesting, not very useful for the simple app. Finally, I didn't tell you about authoring your own actions, but if you're interested, feel free to contact me at GitHub. I even have my own actions published. Uh, so I have some experience with that and I would say that it's really simple to make. Yeah, and that's it. Um, the links, uh, don't try to read them, just click them when you get the slides. Uh, it's basically this app. It's uh, a list of awesome actions, uh, a great list of awesome actions on GitHub. There are dozens of good examples there and two links to the documentation. And uh, thank you for staying this long. I hope that it was kind of informative for you. I hope that you are not too bored. And yeah, if you have any questions, ask them or contact me in GitHub. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sergey. I really enjoyed your talk and the examples were really nice. The chess example is really crazy, but yeah. By as the way, far as end, sorry. Let's look the outcome. Probably, it's <laughs> as as far as I understood, the latest piece of this uh, issue may be the sequence number of steps or something. And as far as I understood, like dozens of people already. <laughs> tried to move the chess. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. My my step is yes. not the latest one. But oh, you see, uh, if you see my screen again, uh, last few moves, here is my GitHub. Uh, it was mm -hmm. already processed. So as you see, that problem, uh, move mm -hmm. it from uh, from uh, A4 to A4 B3. To B3. Yeah, th this is actually processed. <laughs> We've played a game of chess as well. And yeah, I'll, I'll be getting an email about this move and about the game outcome as well. So yeah, this is very, very crazy stuff. Great. Uh, can you just, from your experience, compare GitHub actions with the other players on CI/CD field, like, is it mature enough to switch all your projects or it's just a matter of uh, preferences? For example, uh, now I, I know uh, very popular is Circle CI. Does it have some advantages or disadvantages? Just your experience, what do you think? 
Yeah, uh, good question. Well, unfortunately, I didn't work with Circle CI, uh, but I I've been working with Jenkins for like a few years, and I have a lot of experience with GitLab CI CD. Mm -hmm. Well, what should I say? Comparing to Jenkins, um, like you probably know, in Russian, it's like comparing sky and earth. <laughs> it's very very yeah. different because um, Jenkins is well, it. I wouldn't use Jenkins anymore after GitHub uh, GitHub and, uh, actions because it's it looks now it looks for me so cumbersome to you know to admin it. I was an admin for Jenkins for like a year and I had a lot of pain installing plugins. Are you talking about pipelines. the first version or even second, the second, second one? Version second with pipelines and grooving, yeah. But they don't feel that good, and of course. All such neat features like marketplace, they, they really makes a difference because look at this site. Um, it's, it's really, it really looks good. Why not? Uh, it, it makes very, very easy to share, uh, to share your own actions, to reuse actions. You, know, you see this good UI where you can find, for example, action for Gradle. Use the Gradle here, and there are dozens of actions. If you want to, for example, build an Android app, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, there is a ready action. You just and you click it, and you see this example how to use it. You can put it straightly into your code. It's way more simpler than uh, writing reusable uh, Jenkins plugins because I I actually wrote one Jenkins plugin and it was a big pain. Uh, but yeah, that was Jenkins and. Also, GitLab. comparing to GitLab, yeah, yeah, it's very, very similar. Actually, I would say that uh, GitHub um, like copied shamelessly. It. So almost every features uh, are the same. They came very, very, very on par, like each to other. Uh, there are some little difference. Like for example, in GitLab, you can specify that an action can safely fail. You can say like, I am okay that this comment fails. It's okay. It will be uh, drawn as orange, like a warning sign, but it mm -hmm. won't fail the whole action. In GitHub, you don't have such a feature currently. Uh, you can use those if actions. Yeah, yeah. Remember, I tell you like if always, it will continue mm -hmm. to execute the job even the previous one failed, but the overall status will be like failing. But it's, you know, it's a very, very small feature and you can overcome this, it's not critical. About the stability, um, well, GitHub Actions are almost one year old now. They were released late in 2018, I guess. So even more than one year. Um, well, <laughs> as far as I'm not a GitHub employee, I can't say how stable they are. They can change things tomorrow. Tomorrow they may new, make a new press release saying like, yeah, we completely refactored GitHub Actions. All your actions don't work anymore, but probably it won't happen because you know there are a lot of users and they put a lot of effort into them. Uh, what what I'm saying, uh, but by the way, um, uh, I know that GitLab CI/CD is also changing a lot. Uh, new features appearing because, um, for example, GitLab uh, already uh, recently introduced a feature of um, imports. Uh, they didn't have any way to sharing your code uh, like a few years ago. It was like you have to copy those YAML files whenever you want it. And now they have something similar to GitHub Marketplace. You can import another YAMLs into your your own like definition. And this feature appeared after GitHub released its actions. So they really look at each other and they really change uh, frequently. So I would say that they have pretty much about at the same level of uh, stability. They're both changing and they're both great. Like Toyer commented, uh, yeah, GitLab see. seems visually more appealing. Feels like GitHub lacks the visual appeal. Pipelines looks much more visual in GitLab CI. I would say that yeah, but... they are a little bit different in representation because I mostly work with GitLab on my projects. And I would say that GitHub just built another uh, representation of this UI. 
And I, I would say that currently for me, for example, GitHub UI overall is over complicated because you see like on your screen dozens of links dozens of buttons like for me it looks like they need to simplify it a little bit but still it's usable and if you really use github as a working tool you will not see any issues yeah, the problem is also maybe that I use it uh, scaling to be my UI bigger for the presentation. Actually, now I scale it back to 100%. Mm -hmm. And um, probably that affected your perception of that. But, uh, well, actually, it looks pretty nice. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's security notations. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's a matter of taste. Uh, by the way, uh, I would say that the most beautiful from all these CIs that I seen was Blue Ocean by Jenkins. <laughs> it was a really a fresh breeze back five years ago when they released it. It was really cool. Uh, so GitHub Actions didn't have uh, that impression on me because probably I was used to GitLab at that time. Um, but still, they, there's a good UI. So. Yeah, no, I think I think it shows much better now. Thanks. I think this view definitely shows way better than the one you had before. So I think this is this shows much more visual appeal. Thank you. Yeah, I just use it to scale and to to be bigger. Mm, okay. Okay. One thing I see that maybe uh, looks better in GitHub that they already won the game for open source so now if you have to choose between gitlab and github for open source projects i don't see any point to use gitlab because in github you have already everything you need so for open source they basically won this war i would say yeah, I agree. I used GitLab for a lot of time uh, just for storing private repositories because they offered unlimited private repositories. And so I used GitLab uh, CI CD for that. But uh, like a year ago, GitHub announced that now there are private repositories in GitHub and there are actions in GitHub. So yeah, now you're completely covered by GitHub. Yeah, so the only point to use GitLab now is when you have to host it on premises yeah. because as far as Thanks. I know GitHub is still not much wants to cover that field they have some uh, on premises uh, like pricing for organizations but they would like to sell you cloud version not on premises and gitlab is mostly used by some companies who would like to host it by themselves yeah uh, Anton, i think you're spot on there i think uh, definitely the companies who have the on-prem versions um will probably be a little bit more hesitant to move over if, if they are with gitlab uh, but definitely makes a lot of sense um, for those who are open to use, you know, um, cloud versions. So I think GitHub was definitely a uh, preference. It'll be a player now, definitely, compared to what it was before. Yes, and I've heard that uh, just recently, GitLab just removed the basic paid versions, like $5 per user and $10 per user. And now they have only $20 per user. And this is exactly the same price that GitHub has. So com competition will be even more aggressive, I would say, because it used to be much cheaper to buy GitLab than GitHub. But nowadays, if the price is the same, if you are not forced to use on-premises, I will go for GitHub. I think yeah, it's a level, it's a level playing field, yeah. Sorry, uh, it's a level playing field, I think, now, for sure. 
Yes, yes, and they both provide uh, exactly the same amount of free computation minutes per month. It's two thousand. Like they, the first one was GitHub, GitLab. They offered two thousand per month, but then uh, GitHub offered the same amount, like exactly. Yeah. For us, it's good because they will try to attract people and make more features public. As I see, for example. For GitLab, they used to have many features only for uh, enterprise version, and now they slightly move everything to the uh, how it's called community version. So people really has a choice, as, and that's good. And I, I agree with you regarding the Jenkins. I remember my experience, it was really painful to maintain all these pipelines, all these plugins, because you have to inform everybody in the team that now you have to maintain this instance. And so it's just a, a lot of headache. And I, I believe that with this, I would say that the starting point was GitLab when they introduced their pipelines with all this fancy uh, YAML, uh, how would say, GitLab YAML files. I would say they yeah, yes, just yes. opened the era for uh, code-based CI/CD pipelines. And now I would say that nobody wants to move back to some XML or whatever visual representation like we used to have in Jenkins. And nevertheless, Jenkins moved to their uh, second version of pipelines. But I would say that it would be much simpler just to buy a whole box like GitLab and not to maintain separate things. Like we also mentioned, we used to have Garrett for one thing, Jenkins for another, and now nobody wants to pay money for person who will maintain all this stuff. It's just literally much easier to save money and just buy one license or 10 licenses for this product. Yeah, well, actually, I uh, want to add, uh... I think that the first one offering uh, at the market for that YAML features was Travis. Uh, Travis. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it, it was uh, really popular on Git, GitHub. Yeah, yeah, and it was very tightly um, tightly bounded to GitHub. Basically, they were, if you're using GitHub, you're using Travis. It was an equal sign. Uh, and they were first to offer that YAML configs and so on. But I think that now with GitHub Actions, they will like uh, unexist in, in a year probably because uh, now they don't have any any extra features to add to GitHub Actions. Maybe the only thing that they have uh, virtual machines and there are still some cases when you really need virtual machine and not the container. But yeah, the this, market this is, is, is. Sorry, sorry yeah. for interrupting. I, I just uh, want to add that the market for this, some uh, runners that are not so common, like Docker containers, the market is really tight. Well, actually, I want to add that uh, you can host your own runner in GitHub. And uh, if you, for example, put a QM or virtual VM in that runner, and you make use of that runner in your action scripts, you can freely use uh, virtual machines in, uh, in GitHub Actions. Uh, it's just a matter that you will have a, a layer of that runner stuff bef between GitHub Actions and the VM. So Actions won't use the VM directly, but it's, I think it's still doable. Great. So guys, maybe, Someone wants to ask any other question because we basically 
we are talking and talking. Um, Karthik? Hi. Yeah. I just have one uh, small question. Like, uh, when it comes to the marketplace, um, how about the security? Like, uh, since I, I think you showed one uh, marketplace in the, for AWS uh, integration, right? Where we we intend to share the AWS key and the secret. So do we need to make sure whether the actions what we make use from the marketplace is secure enough? Uh, so just a bit of uh, concern in that. Yeah, that's actually a very good question. I didn't cover it because you know I don't want to dig much into details, but I, I have something to say about that. Of course, mm -hmm. all these actions are written by other people and uh, I am an, as an action uh, as an action also, I can, for example, get your um, credentials and yeah. post them to my server and use them in, <laughs> in my uh, way. And this is really uh, like, no, yeah, it, it can be. Uh, the only way to, you know, mitigate that is to go uh, find those actions. For example, we used RES configure, right? And to read yeah. their code. Uh, the same thing could be with. Um, with Jenkins, uh, a malicious Jenkins plugin could also steal your credentials as well. But I think with GitHub Actions is that they are really easy to understand because uh, they have a very, very simple API. It's JavaScript API. So if, mm -hmm. if in doubt, you can open this uh, action code at GitHub because every, every GitHub action is stored at GitHub. You can see their code. It's not binary, okay. it's published to um, Jenkins GitHub or Jenkins uh, plugin repository. It's actual code that you can go and check it if, if you're in doubt. That's the uh, yeah. first issue. The second issue is that some actions, you see, uh, they are verified by GitHub. And um, some uh, enterprises like Amazon, like uh, GitHub itself, they publish actions to GitHub Marketplace uh, by themselves. And if you look at this repository, uh, awesome actions that I linked to you. Um, you'll see that there are plenty of companies that are publishing actions for themselves. There are actions for Asia, I guess. Uh, no, probably not for Asia. Um, Maybe for GCP? Yeah, no, no, this, this one, a collection of actions. Yeah, probably GCP, let's think. GCP. Yes, external services. So, um, no, not this one. Okay. Well, uh, let, okay, let's stick back to AWS. Uh, here at GitHub Marketplace, I see this uh, like verified sign. This is a verified publisher. Uh, okay. And this, is action, uh, this action is actually resides in a, in a repository owned by AWS. It's not a repository owned by me. And so on. So this kind of uh, uh, kind of improves the level of security. Uh, so using these actions by verified uh, publishers is like this verified creator. Uh, it's kind of good. But uh, you're you're absolutely right. Um, if you have some unpopular, for example, stuff to do, like for example, I publish it an action to check Gradle version. Uh, I want to make sure that uh, my builds uses the latest Gradle version. Uh, check Gradle version. Um, yeah. So basically, if you want to check this in your pipeline, you go to Marketplace, you write here, check Gradle version, and you have a choice of two. Uh, one by me, six stars, okay. one by some other guy, two stars. And th this is your choice. Two stars or six stars? Who do you believe more? And yeah, you need to go open both of these actions and check that they don't steal anything from you. And this is a big okay. issue, but I think that there is no a good solution for it. Um, uh, by the way, uh, GitHub itself, if if a malicious actions, uh, for example, don't send uh, your secrets to its own servers, but just tries to print it into the console so they are exposed to public. Uh, GitHub um, actually it filters out all the outputs from all steps from all actions and if it um, if it encounters your secret so for example you have a secret with the value ABC 
And if it mm -hmm. encounters ABC in output of any action, it thinks that this action probably prints the secret to output and it masks it. So it won't be visible uh, in in the pipeline. I will right. uh, kind of kind of show you this this AWS how does okay, it. Okay, so so that's the inbuilt feature provided by GitHub Action. Yeah, it yeah, masks it's basically the, the same as in GitLab. Exactly yeah. the same. I have one more question. Maybe you know this text for actions like v1, v2. Do you actually get some notification if someone pushed changes to action you use in your repo or you have to like once in a while open them and check maybe, for example, configure AWS credentials v2 exists and you have to switch is there any Just chance to get like you know for example for uh old uh package json requirements you have a bot that will tell you depend hey exactly. yeah depend the bot uh, well, just to add to the previous point about security, uh, you see that here, uh, this yeah. action, it tries to output, you see this, it was masked, so it won't be exposed. Sure. Uh, to answer yeah. your question, Anton, uh, this uh, V1 and V2, it's actually, uh, as you guessed it, it tags in, uh, in a Git repository. Um, so you have like kind of a few options. First, you can go to the repository with this action. Um, uh, and you can uh, watch that repository. Uh, every repository has this watch mm -hmm. button. So if you're interested in new, new releases, I, I can mm -hmm. watch my, my own repository, but you can watch it. Uh, that's the first option. The second option, you can use uh, add uh, and the branch name, not a tag name like v1 and v2. You can use like add master. And whenever a new mm. commit is in master, mm -hmm you'll get the latest version. But here is the problem from another point. Uh, for example, you you reviewed the action and it was okay in V1, but in V2, they may expose your secrets. And if you use like master at some point, it may start exposing your secrets without you knowing that. Mm -hmm. and so probably yes. you should stick to text, to, to review the text uh, for critical stuff. And for non-critical stuff, you can uh, use uh, like latest versions and it's okay. Is that got it? What Thank was you. the other question? Um, yeah, notifications. Yeah, uh, you can use it with watching. Mm -hmm. Thank, thanks, I thanks think again. they will introduce something like depend the bot in future because if uh, the action, for example, that they maintain switched to v2 or v3, they are interested to get people moved so. I think in future we will see something like depend bot for actions. Yeah, they actually have depend bot working for actions code. Here is my uh, check Gradle version uh, code <coughs> in GitHub, and depend bot sees that I am using some outdated JavaScript libraries here, and mm -hmm. it even creates pull requests uh, automatically for me. You see, ninety six public pull requests from from depend bot in my repository. It like. Every day, it says me that I could update some things. <laughs> That's so, yeah, nice I, world I of it. JavaScript. Yes, exactly. Okay, thank you. So, guys, if no one wants to ask any questions, I guess we are done. I believe that you enjoyed both talks. And I think that today's meetup was really technical. I like it. And uh, I just want to mention again that please propose any talk you want to share with the community. And uh, we will be glad to see you as a presenter on our next meetup. <laughs>